Pardon the interruption, but I'm Pablo Torre, and I won Family Feud on Monday, Tony, but you should know that this is my favorite TV appearance of the week. Tony Kornheiser, do you think I'm buying that? That can't possibly be true. Not, not a word of it. Stop it. I need to ask you some questions, because I saw, I saw what you did in the, is it called the lightning round or the final round, whatever Fast it is? Fast money. Do you? Fast money, yes. Yeah. Do you win money for that, or does the money go to charity? Can you make a deal where you say, well, I was so good, at least give me half of the money, give it to me in cash now, do you do that? A food insecurity charity got the $25,000, but the, the redounding to my ego was truly um, a fortune beyond, beyond imagination. Yeah, I am rich in, in but, narcissism now. But, but no cash money? No straight no, no. money homes? Nothing like that? Really? No, no. It's I do get bad. paid for this, though, which, you know, I like it. Yeah, this show's not family feud. Stop it. This is basic <laughs> cable. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. Wilbon apparently had better things to do, so I'm joined by our great friend, the host of the podcast, Pablo Torre, finds out, Mr. Pablo Torre. Come on, you can do better than that. He just won a bunch of Come money. On, guys. And we begin well, today with Shohei Otani. Going somewhere no baseball player has ever gone, the land of 50-50. Otani had an extraordinary game yesterday. He went six for six against the Marlins. He drove in 10 runs. He had five extra base hits, including three home runs, and he stole two bases. So now he sits at 51 and 51. Pablo, you were a writer. What word would you describe, what, to, what word would you use to describe what Otani did in this game? Yeah, this is tricky for me, Tony, because my answer in the immediate aftermath of the game is different than the answer I want to give you now. Because in the aftermath, I think of a lead like Shohei Otani has defeated hyperbole, period. You can't say things about the guy that are nice enough because he has done things that people could not do in 100 years worth of careers he did in one game, Yeah, right? Beyond inventing a new club, a club that he is the lone member of, which is, again... Post-hyperbolic, I would say. But today, when I get a bit of remove from it, I'm thinking to myself, the greatest compliment I could pay him is that he actually underachieved. And the reason I do that is because I zoom out and I remember, Tony, that this guy next season is going to start pitching again. That's and I'm right. like, when yeah. we rewind the tape on this, Cooperstown <sighs> time, I'm like, this might not be the most impressive thing he does as a single game is concerned. Yeah, so I mean no offense to you. I just wish Wilbon was on today because Wilbon has not been particularly charitable to Otani this year. He has undercut some of his achievements. He talks about the fact all the time that Otani does not play the field when he compares him to Francisco Lindor, and he talks about the MVP race, and I would just say, let me know. Call me when Lindor drives in 10 runs in one <laughs> game. I think we are maybe seeing the greatest baseball player of all time, and, yes. and I'll go to your point here. That next year he's going to pitch, and he's a career ERA, I think, of 3.01. I, I want to get a couple of numbers out for context on the 50-50 thing, even though I said the other day on the show that it's somewhat of a gimmick. It's somewhat arbitrary to say we're going to take home runs and we're going to take stolen bases. Somewhat arbitrary. Yep. But there have been, in the history of baseball, 49 50 home run seasons, 49 different 50 home run season, sometimes the same person over a couple of different years. The average amount of stolen bases by the people who achieved that is 7.4. There have been 241 50 stolen base seasons, and the average amount of home runs by people who steal 50 bases is 8.4. This guy <laughs> has 50 and 50, and oh, by the way, he only gets thrown out. He's only gotten thrown out four times this year. So I have a logical point to go to now, and forgive me for taking all the time. Is it, a, no. is it the greatest season I have ever seen? No, it's up there, but I don't have it over 73 home runs. I don't have it over 191 RBI. I don't have it over an ERA of 1.12, and I don't have it over a 56-game hitting streak, but it is up there. Is it the greatest single game ever? No. Reggie Jackson had three home runs in the World Series game, and Ted Williams, when he could have sat out a doubleheader and landed on 400 just barely, I believe won six for eight and went to 406. Is it, but, right. but it's a great achievement. I, one more thing to add. I am glad that when the infielder threw him a 68-mile-an-hour pitch and he hit it out, <laughs> I'm glad that wasn't 50. Because if that was yes. 50 and that's all he got, it would have been cheapened, and now there's no ambiguity. Right. The whole thing, the whole night, 
The only uh, sort of footnote that I want to apply to it is that the entire thing felt like a carnival game, right? The score was a zillion to four or whatever it was. The right. reality of it, Tony, yeah. is that you need a manager, an opposing manager and Skip Schumacher, I believe, to want to pitch to the guy. And luckily, pitch to the him. manager of the Marlins said, him. believe that, I'm pitching to him. And here's the upside now, right? right. I just want to look ahead to the postseason. Shohei Otani is all of these things we've described. He is historical. He is one of one. And yet he is also the, among active players, he is the player who has had the longest active postseason drought. Over 860 yeah. some odd games. Angels. And so this same Angels. guy, exactly, because of that Angels career, went to the Dodgers. They just clinched. We're going to get to see him try some of this in the postseason. And that, yeah. that among gifts to baseball, Tony, Shohei Otani in the playoffs, the best may actually be yet to come. And I mean that without hyperbole at all. But we should move on ourselves to the NFL and the Jets pounding the Patriots last night, 24 to 3. Because Aaron Rodgers, he moved well, he threw well, but he also did not want Robert Sala's hug, just for the record. So Tony, did 40-year-old Aaron Rodgers convince you that he's actually back to four? I, I thought he was very good. I mean, and I think the running well was the most important thing for me. He did not run like he was afraid of a torn Achilles. You know, I expected him to pass well. He's a great passer. He completed 77% of his passes. That, I think, is a given. But over the top for me is that if he, if he can move around back there, if he can get out of the pocket, if he can run around, then I think he's a very dangerous quarterback again. And I did hear him say that he felt he was looking at himself five years ago. So he was very pleased. I don't want to get carried away with the Jets. They have now beaten two of the three worst teams in the league. They've beaten New England yes. and Tennessee. The trifecta would be Carolina. And I sat on this show yesterday and I said, if they don't win this game, we shouldn't talk about them at all for the rest of the entire season. So they won big to me as expected, as expected. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to set the curve on this game within the context of the Patriots, who for two weeks we took seriously. And now we think no. should never be invited into no. the room where we discuss serious no. things. Because, Tony, yeah. the Patriots offense, just to give the full picture of this, the Patriots offense was one of those uh, roadkill things. You got to poke with a stick to make sure it's still alive. 40 total <laughs> yards in the first half for the Patriots. You're like, yeah. wait a minute. What, what, are we, what are we doing here? And so Aaron Rodgers, by comparison, was in full bloom, was young, younger than he's ever been. Um, but I am, I am not using the Patriots as the measuring stick for whether this guy is back or not. Yeah, I mean, look, to be fair, it was a bad game to watch, and I bailed out on it. I, I guess I really missed. Really brutal. I miss that whole thing. Maybe I was distracted. I miss that whole thing where he moves in for a hug and Rodgers pushes him away. And Rodgers said, you know, afterwards he thought it was a joke and all of that. I will say, and I hate to admit this, I am still drawn to Aaron Rodgers, even with the vaccine stuff, even with the Bolero mm -hmm. stuff, even with the hallucinogens, you know, with all <laughs> of that stuff. I'm still sort of drawn to him because, you know, Pablo, he understands the spotlight and I suppose he lives for it. I suppose he does. So. Yeah, and look, in, in, I'm not in, gonna in make, New York. Go ahead. No, no. Look, him, Aaron Rodgers off platform, Aaron Rodgers on the move, Aaron Rodgers being surgical in a way that suggests he has a, an intellectual mastery, but also a physical advantage. Yeah. That's, that's what's exciting here. I just want to remind everybody, yes. the Jets without him won seven games last year, okay? So the, the, the bar to clear is not, can you beat the Patriots? It's, are you a playoff team? That's right. That is that's his right. challenge as a New York star to be. And we don't know that, and, and this no. doesn't prove it. We move no. to the NBA and the yappy Joel Embiid. Embiid signed a contract extension with the 76ers that will keep him there through 2029 and will pay him $192 million over the last three years of the deal. Embiid said of Philadelphia fans, quote, you guys deserve a championship, and I think we're just getting started, unquote. Pablo, you believe in trusting the process? Are you convinced Embiid will deliver a championship? So just the sticker shock on this, Tony, I want to acknowledge that I don't feel it. I have been numb to the prices that you pay now for max contracts in the NBA. I believe Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown each are making the GDP of a small island nation. I'm just used to it by now. So the numbers you throw at me, okay. whatever. That's just the price of doing business. However, when it comes to what was the choice here, I believe there was no choice. I believe that, of course, if you're the Sixers, you stick with Joel Embiid and you give him all of that money underneath 
that price. And the reason I say that is because I believe the Sixers have the best big three in the NBA. They do. That's my belief. Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey, Paul George, three max players making up the vast majority of the salary cap. And I believe that Daryl Morey, the GM, his whole challenge now is to make sure they get pieces around them to make it so that you make a conference finals. So you got to do it. You should do it. Will they win a title? I've been traumatized enough to not be so presumptuous. This is their best shot at doing it, though. Okay, am I convinced that Joel Embiid will deliver a championship? No, and, and why should I be, really? When he says we're just getting started, hold on a second. You played there for eight years already. You have never made the conference oh, wow. final. You have played with Jimmy Butler. You have played with James Harden. You have never made the conference final. So now you have, in Paul George, I think one of the least clutch performers of all time. I have a statistic that you will love he has been in five game sevens in the playoffs in his life, and he has shot 30 for 81 in that period of time, which is really not very good at all. Now, maybe he'll be the magic guy. Maybe he will. But if you ask me for the visual that I remember most about Joel Embiid at any time in his career, it's him laying on the ground on his back, holding his leg. Because he is hurt. He's a great player. He's hurt all the time, Pablo. He averages 54 yeah. games a year, right? That's all I'm saying. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, look, I get it. I get why no one should believe that Joel Embiid is going to be healthy by the end of the year. I just dare anybody to tell me whether you feel better about cutting him loose because his price tag is too high. No, it is a you bit have of a to sign 22, him. And my you optimism, have to Tony, sign him. my optimism is a product of a lack of options. So I admit to that. You have to sign him. He is a great player. I'm just saying, when you say we're just getting started and you've been there eight years, yeah, well, that's, let's take that's, a break. Yeah. Coming up, will the Ravens get their first win of the season in Dallas? And would you rather have Caleb Williams or Anthony Richardson on Sunday? You know, it took Julius Irving to get Moses Malone to win a title in Philadelphia. And Julius Irving was a great yep. player. Is It's time for toss-up. Two men enter. One man leaves, having left pieces of the celebrated winner of Family Feud in his wake. What's mm. first? Toss-up, they play on Sunday in Dallas. Who do you favor? The 0-2 Ravens or the 1-1 one one Cowboys? So it doesn't matter really who I favor. Vegas has installed Baltimore as a road favorite, one point. We had Booger McFarlane on the show the other day, and we asked him, why was the Dallas Cowboys defense so soft against New Orleans? And he said, because they are soft. Well, if they are soft and Baltimore finally decides to hand Derrick Henry the ball, he's going to gain 100 to 120 yards. Normally, Pablo, I would pick Dallas at home because for years I thought they were a pretty good home team. But the last two home games they've had, they got waxed. New Orleans killed them last week. And, and yep. the prior game was Green Bay in the playoffs. They gave up 92 points at home in these two games. And I honestly think that Baltimore wants this game more, needs it more. Maybe a must game for Baltimore because there's only been six teams in the history of the NFL that have started a season 0-3 and still made the playoffs. Yeah, I'm buying low on Baltimore. And it's because I tried to watch the games in question and I saw, of course, the Cowboys beat a totally irrelevant Deshaun Watson in week one, yeah. cool. Uh, and then in week two, they got blown out by the Saints, as you mentioned. And I don't believe the Saints quite yet are a team that should impress me, even as they blow out other teams. And so that leads me to believe that the Cowboys are just not that good. And the Ravens, despite being 0-2, Tony, they could have beaten the Chiefs in week one, right? Could've. Very, very close Could've. to toenail, Could've. right? Might have might have, might yep. have won in regular, yep. That's right. regular time. And then, and then, of course, they choke it against the Raiders and... Yeah. They almost won that one, too. So give me the Ravens. I think they're supposed to be good this season. I'm not going to be swayed by a two-game sample in which the other team is actually less impressive despite having one more win. All right, what's next? What's Toss next? up, they play on Sunday. Which quarterback would you rather have, Caleb Williams or Anthony Richardson? So I was so hoping that Chicago would be playing at Pittsburgh and we would keep this question and it would be Caleb Williams or Justin Fields and I could say I don't want either of them and Wilbon's head would explode and that would make me so happy because he loves yeah. them both. Um, Anthony Richardson has a cannon for an arm. He does. Now, Caleb Williams was a better college quarterback. He slumped a little bit in his last year. He's a better college quarterback. 
but he's having trouble adjusting to the pros. I believe he's been sacked nine times already. Um, Anthony Richardson's yep. having trouble too because he, he can't stay healthy. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to take Anthony Richardson in this game, and I would take him if he played for Chicago because I think Chicago is better than Indianapolis, I do. Yeah, look, the issue with the Anthony Richardson has a cannon argument is that typically uh, the people you're firing cannonballs at don't catch the cannonballs and run towards you <laughs> okay. with the cannonball. That was the problem for him last week after unveiling it as such in week one. And to me, Caleb Williams, again, it's a buy low opportunity. That's a through line of these topics in this segment with me, Tony, because Caleb Williams can't get much worse, right? He can't. Right. That's right. He has zero right. help on the offensive line. He has yet to score a That's touchdown. Right. He's averaging under 100 yards of offense a game. He's, I believe, at the point where they call it, I believe, in, in the world of economics, uh, a dead cat bounce. Sometimes things are so brutal that the thing really? bounces back up just when you think it's absolutely at its worst. And I think that is this Colts game, a bit of a dead cat bounce wow. for Caleb Williams. I, I mean, I, I, do think, I do think that Caleb Williams as a good long-term buy, but he's having trouble early, as rookie quarterbacks do. That's it. Trouble. Let's take one last break. Still to come, could Justin Herbert miss Sunday's game against the Steelers? And could the Niners face the Rams down two more stars? Two more stars, I'm guessing now. Give me that phrase again. I like that it's phrase. It's a dead cat Say it bounce. Again. It's a dead cat bounce. Just, it's like when you see the graph of a stock yeah. and it goes all the way down, but then there's a little bit of life. And then it may go down that again, sounds... but for a week. It sounds like a good title for a children's book. A little scary for kids, maybe. <laughs> Dead Cat Bounce, but with good illustrations, you yes. can read it. Happy time, people. Happy 36th birthday, Sergei Bobrovsky. The Florida Panthers goalie won the Stanley Cup this June, one year after losing in the Stanley Cup final last June. So that's eight playoff series in two years, and he won seven of them. This past year, Bobrovsky led the NHL in shutouts with six. He had a .915 save percentage over the course of the season. In Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final, Bobrovsky saved 23 of 24 shots, a .958 save percentage. Bobrovsky twice won the Vesna Trophy with Columbus in 2013 and 2017. He made his second All-Star game last season, finished third in the Vesna voting. In the four clinching games the Panthers won in the recent playoffs, Bobrovsky gave up four goals, stopping 99 of 103 shots. Tony, I have three Bobrovsky facts for you in ascending order of importance. Number one, the dude was undrafted, a remarkable rise in career trajectory. Number two, his last name Bobrovsky means beaver, it turns out. And number three, his nickname is Bob. So, you're welcome. Not beaver? Bob? That's crazy. Certainly not. Happy anniversary, Cal Ripken Jr. On this day 26 years ago, the final home game of the Orioles season, Ripken decided to end his consecutive game streak at 2,632, having already gone 502 games past Lou Gehrig. After the first out, fans, Orioles teammates, Yankee players stepped out of their dugouts to give Ripken a standing ovation. Ripken later said he ended the streak on his own terms to avoid any off-season controversy about his playing status. Ripken returned to the O's lineup for the final seven games of the season all on the road. Pablo Wilbon and I were at the game in Baltimore where Ripken broke Gehrig's record of 2,130. Very memorable for me, very much so. Yeah, less memorable for me despite being a Yankee fan because at that point in my life, I was nine. Um, so what do you remember from that evening? Because I remember it very blurrily in a haze of like lunch boxes and juice, juice boxes. I remember this. If you were nine and I was already 70, we're not having anything to do with each other. <laughs> Happy trails to the WNBA's regular season. My local Washington Mystics beat Caitlin Clark in the Indiana Fever last night before a league record crowd of 20,711. But the Mystics still lost out on the eighth and final playoff spot to the Atlanta Dream. The Dream opens its best of three first round series at top seeded New York Liberty on Sunday. And while Liberty had the league's best record, the Minnesota Lynx, the Connecticut Sun, Las Vegas Aces also have to be considered title contenders, especially with the Aces having won the last two championships. Clark and the Fever, the sixth seed, they will face the third seeded Sun, who won three of the four times the teams met in the regular season. Yeah, Tony, remember last season, it was all about the super teams, the Liberty, the Aces. Now, Caitlin Clark has made the fever into a real, actual contender. And I just saw the Liberty lose again to the Minnesota Lynx in Brooklyn in person. And that's not going to be easy. The Liberty need to beat the Lynx to win this thing. And I don't know if they can, frankly. 
over 20,000 people in Washington last night to see Caitlin Clark. Running out of show, we go to the big finish. In addition to Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel, the Niners could be missing George Kittle and Nick Bosa against the Rams on Sunday. Your thoughts? The Rams are missing Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. The Niners should be able to pull this off anyway. The Tigers and the Orioles, though, they start a three-game series this evening. Is that a big deal? Yeah, the Tigers are suddenly very, very hot. And Baltimore is 25 and 30 since July 20th. Yeah. Justin Herbert, questionable for Sunday's game in Pittsburgh. Is that a big deal? Yeah, both teams are undefeated right now. But without Justin Herbert, I think that obviously is a problem for the Chargers. They will lose. Uh, college football ranked matchup tonight. Number 24, Illinois. At number 22, Nebraska. Who you got? I'll take the home team in Lincoln. I'll take Nebraska. Last one, NHL preseason starts tomorrow. Do you think that's too soon? Yeah, I was told it's still summer technically until like the 22nd or 23rd. So hockey in the summer, objectively too soon. Sorry, hockey. It is too soon, isn't it? We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Pablo Torre. Thank you so much for watching. Pablo Torre finds out is my show it's on the internet. But for now, you're a sports center. Mr. Family Feud. Good for you. I deal well with I've bald seen the guys. Clip. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't say that your neighbors were good, though.